this is a highly emerging, a highly active area of drug development. There are over 15 approved gene therapy uh, molecules in the U.S. My talk is going to be what are the analytical strategies required to ensure successful development and commercialization of gene therapy assets. Welcome to Emory Pharma Speaker Series. Uh, today, we're honored to have Dr. Ness Musa uh, here uh, presenting on a very important topic, analytical strategies for gene therapy drug development. Dr. Musa spent his a number of years working on his master's and PhD degree at the University of Surrey in UK. He spent 11 years at uh, Lanza in uh, progressively expanding roles uh, and uh, five years at uh, Bristol Myers Squibb and another five years at Ultragenics, uh, gene therapy, cell therapy, orphan disease company that's headed by my friend Emil Kakis. And uh, recently, um, Dr. Musa uh, started his own a consulting company, Dynamic Biologics Consulting, uh, and we're obviously a client of Musa, uh, Dr. Musa, and, and lo love to collaborate uh, with uh, you uh, watching this video, and of course, Dr. Musa, on uh, your analytical project. So with this, uh, I'm going to pass on the microphone to Dr. Musa. And thank you, Ron. Uh, Amit, thank you for your invitation. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, Emory Pharma, a very uh, good company and a very good friend, Ron. Uh, this is a good occasion for us to discuss uh, and collaborate on advanced medicine analytical strategy and technologies. So I think, Ron, as we discussed uh, over the years, this industry is evolving. Uh, the evolution is basically Historically, we used to use uh, natural healing and small molecules, and then after many years of small molecules, now we, ad we came into the advan advent of biologics, uh, protein-based therapeutics, where we try to cure diseases at the cellular level. The latest over the last 20 years, we have progressed our uh, technology to gene therapy. So the topic today is going to be around uh, analytical strategies for gene therapy drug developments. So we'll try to mention about gene therapy drug development, but our focus is going to be what are the analytical tools required to strategize, to manage early phase development all the way to commercialization. So this is me. I have my own uh, consulting firm, Dynamica, managing CMCs, analytical development, quality control, due diligence and uh, selection of C COs and the CMOs, as well as technical team development. So Ron, thank you uh, for your custom. Uh, so let's talk about the topics I would like to discuss today. We have limited time, it's one of the first, but we'll try to cover three areas in terms of gene therapy, drug development, and how analytical strategy is a critical element in the drug development activities for gene therapy. So gene therapy drug development and what are the clinical quality attributes for the drug itself and what analytical tools do we have to help us manage the development activities and commercialization of gene therapy assets. So this will be the key topics for our discussion. And to discuss those effectively, I would like us to mention uh, what is the relevance of uh, CQA? CQA is a cr uh, critical quality attributes for the drug product, uh, which are important to help us manage the manufacturing process to ensure we have consistent manufacturing process. And how do we select the methods to use to develop and commercialize uh, gene therapy molecules? And I will give an example in, forms in, a, in the form of case studies, uh, select uh, technologies to discuss 
to highlight the analytical strategy for this uh, new uh, advanced medicine modality gene, th gene therapy. So over the years, in addition to the evolution from small molecules to protein-based therapeutics to gene therapy, the gene therapy landscape itself has been evolving uh, pretty aggressively over the last uh, six to uh, eight years. So now in the clinic, we have over 500 clinical trial projects in the, in the US. Globally, if you include EU, other, other uh, Asian uh, countries, it may go up to 1,000 or more. In the US, there are over 500. This is a highly emerging, a highly active area of drug development. There are over 15 approved gene therapy uh, molecules in the US. And while that's happening, in parallel to that, we also advanced our gene editing technologies. So the gene editing technology is also advancing at a, a rapid rate, uh, led by CRISPR and others. As you might have heard, end of last year, the first gene editing molecule was approved by MHRA in the UK to treat beta th uh, thalassemia. Uh, so these programs are advancing really fast, but they're also getting more refined and far more acute in trying to resolve disease indications, not only treatment, but also trying to find root cause and rectify the root cause of uh, monogenetic disease indications. So why is this relevant for us to discuss this? The motivation for this is this area is growing so fast, there is a lot happening, there is a lot of activities, and getting involved in this area is really eminent and really beneficial. So the, the, the money spent in development and commercialization activities in 2022 was around $15 billion. Now, if we go, the projected expenditure in this area is going to be around $80 billion by 2032. This projection is really dramatic. So that's the motivation. This is a very active area. There is a lot of need. There is a lot of services required and support required to make this happen. And of course, the area of development are uh, multiple. Uh, when, it, when we say advanced medicine in gene therapy, we are including cell therapy as well. So uh, solid cancers, infectious diseases, eye disorders, blood, uh, blood disorders, as well as hematological malignancies and neurological disorders are included in this progressive uh, clinical development area of genetic uh, uh, therapy as well as uh, cell therapy. So as a form of introduction, my talk is going to be what are the analytical strategies required to ensure successful development and commercialization of gene therapy assets? So what are the key analytical uh, strategies that we need to pay attention to? This applies to all gene therapies and cell therapies as well, but the, uh, cr the criticality of the, having the right analytical strategy is majority of the companies developing gene therapies and cell therapies are small and medium-sized biotech companies. So there are multiple limitations, uh, timing, financial limitations that make it important to be strategic. So the money used, the effort spent uh, in the early days will benefit in the later days of the late phase development and potential commercialization. So the process optimization activities that happens earlier with any drug product, this process development activities for gene therapy are very meaningful, meaning that there is a high value to those process optimization activities for one reason, because there is limited experience in this area. We are all learning. Therefore, when we develop uh, a gene therapy asset, we need to make sure that we have the right critical quality attributes defined for the program, for the drug early on, much earlier on. It could be presumptive, uh, CQAs, critical quality attributes, but the e earlier we define them, the better uh, chances we have of granulating the right analytical strategy. And we will focus, I will show you in, the, in my next slide, we are going to focus on recombinant AAV. There are multiple platforms to deliver gene therapy. We'll focus on uh, associate, uh, associate adenovirus 
vehicle for delivering gene therapy. And for that, having an early understanding of CKAs with process development activities is important to garner meaningful analytical strategy. Once we do that, once we understand the criticality of certain uh, quality attributes, then we will be able to select the right uh, analytical tools and phase appropriately qualify and validate them to support eventual commercialization. So as a form example, just to show you, uh, to, to give you some example, these are the platforms used to internalize uh, the gene uh, payload into the patient. Uh, and basically, you have multiple options. Our discussion will, will be centered around AAV today. But to show you, the gene editing area is also growing. There are pros and cons benefits and some uh, you know, uh, disadvantage to, to both of them. For the AAV-based gene therapy, mainly addition of the right gene to the, to the patient population, that is more established than the gene editing technology. So there is benefit in that experience. The agencies are more uh, familiar with it, as well as we know that it's going to be long lasting. We have some experience with it. The new uh, area of genetic uh, uh, addition, when we can silence, we can delete a sequence that thereby resolving the root cause of the disease, that's much newer, but it actually treats the core a disease area, but still emerging technology. So we have a lot more to learn. One of the issues, one of the uh, maybe potential disadvantage for the uh, for the uh, AAV based gene therapy is there is safety issues. We need to be aware of genotoxicity and potential immunologic reactions. So we need to be aware of that, the, the immunogenicity, as well as uh, we we are not suppressing the negative uh, traits of the genetic disease. We are just adding the right. So we don't know what that means in terms of long term. How how will that behave? How will the patient behave in terms of having the 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 the, the, the diseased uh, genetic formula as well as the rectified? So we need to wait and see what would be the outcome. So for AAV, why do we choose AAV more predominantly than other uh, delivery vehicles? Number one, AAV is less uh, pathogenic uh, to humans. And we have more data once the gene is delivered. We believe it will remain, that delivery will remain. So it's protracted, protracted genetic delivery and expression in the system, as well as, as, well as low immunogenicity relative to others. Uh, so this is some of the benefits that people re prefer to use recombinant AAV uh, to other uh, delivery vehicles. Why? Do we need to strategize effectively? It's because of the evolving landscape, because the limited budget, limited timeline, because again, we don't have protracted timeline dealing with orphan diseases, rare diseases. The available time space is limited, as well as um, the budget in aspects also very limited. Therefore, we do the necessary work and we make sure that we are able to deliver this much needed uh, treatments to patients as as, as quickly uh, as, as possible. Of course, the agency approval is critical uh, and the complexity of the programs. These are not simple programs, they are very complex. The complexity is because of our experience. We are still learning how to make them better, how to make them more swiftly, how to make them more reproducible, how to scale up effectively, how to improve the title. So we are still learning, therefore, that complexity makes it uh, m more challenging to manage than traditional biologics or even definitely small molecules. So we are all growing together. The agencies are knowing more about this. We are learning more. Uh, the more we are working on, the more programs we work on, the more challenge we are facing, the greater the learning. And of course, the agencies, are, they know more than us because they are exposed to far more applications. They have far more visibility to multiple uh, forms, development forms and uh, multiple approaches. So as a result, uh, this area is still growing. The opportunities are even are high. They, re they will remain high for the foreseeable future. So basically in terms of development, once the indication is identified 
and the the uh, proof of the concept proof of concept is established by uh, translational sciences we go on to make sure that this process is developable we need to make sure it is developable and eventually manufacturable so we need to assess manf developability and manufacturability therefore the engagement of translational sciences with development teams and operation teams in a sweet uh, team session is critical uh, we need to have the right scale uh, scale down uh, process models to be able to scale up down the line as well as to learn about the right analytics uh, that will help us manage the program the product quality we need to challenge the process the product and analytics using accelerated uh, stability studies and forest deck uh, forest deck studies so we need to screen the tech the technology as well as the conditions uh, you know at the early stages to make sure we have developable and manufacturable asset that is the process development in a nutshell it, it is it's a big chunk of work the main cmc activity is that but having the right cqa to support the manufacturing is very important that consistent manufacturing will require the guidance of the right CQA is being defined that will deliver the right dose to the patients so here we will discuss some of the relevant uh, critical process steps and the relevant CQAs so when it comes to CQA assessment we need to make sure that we we think in the right direction from early on we have to set uh, with the end you know we have to set our eyes on the end game with the, we, we begin with the end in mind where are we trying to go so eventually when we have the intention is to, we, want, we want to commercialize therefore the when we experiment early on the target quality product profile at that early stage when we define that we need to think what kind of technologies are required to support this and with that when we define that, that will eventually help us assess what kind of CQAs we need to develop for us to be able to commercialize this. So the target uh, quality profile, which means that what are the target qualities required for this program, for this product to perform as expected, as intended. And then once we do that, we need to develop the right technology the right analytical technology select the right te te analytical technology to assess the cqas determine the cqas and with that we will define the right critical process parameters the cpps so that we the process the the process will be able to be used uh, to manufacture on a continuous and routine basis and of course we need to also define the critical material attributes because what happens is that the process and the material are very critical elements to give us the right uh, target profile and the right sequence are linked so they feed into each other so therefore we need to ensure we think about this early on and of course the mechanism of defines we have the the target quality profile we identify the cqas then we identify the key process parameters during development stage that we define the upper and lower limits of the CMA the CMA the, what are the critical material and we define them we validate the the vendors and we make sure we don't change unless we qualify the new the new vendor and the CPPs are important to be able to generate the right uh, target quality profile continuously so there is a loop early loop this gives us a good, a good mechanism of understanding how they all talk to each other. So we have to be in a sweet team setting, especially in a, in a small company. It's important we interact effectively to make sure we are on the same page. And the same thing here when it comes to the analytical uh, technology that we use, because we have to use certain analytical tools early on to develop the program. We have to be cognizant that this analytical tool may be used for release they may also be used for in-process testing so we have to keep in mind all the technologies used during early translation trans translation science stages during early development stages they are potential technologies that can be used for release or long-term and extended characterization purposes so we need to think about fit for purpose technologies early on because 
because of the compressed timeline and also reduce, uh, you know, uh, when we are going for orphan designation, that's very critical. So just as an example, uh, this is a flow of a platform uh, manufacturing process. So uh, without going into detail, uh, we get, we grow the cells up to the manufacturing scale. It could be 500 liter or up to maybe 2,000 liter cell culture. Then that goes through the depth filtration, cell lysis to get the AAV. Once we get that, we concentrate and do go into the applicable uh, chromatography steps. Then we alter filter and dye filter into the right formulation. And then we have the, ster the sterile filtration for drug substance, eventually drug product. This process needs to be defined as well as the uh, critical quality attributes in, uh, uh, for each step has to be defined. We have to establish a risk-based assessment. What are the critical quality attributes at, uh, attributes at each of the process steps? This is very important because when we get down to the, to the downstream to alter filter to get into our drug substance, we are on the right track. So we, we start doing this by developing risk-based CQA assessment risk-based CQA uh, uh, definition and identification. Again, when we are talking about risk-based, we have to think about what do I need for phase zero and what do I need for phase uh, three and commercial and eventual life cycle. So the risk-based matrix assessment of CQAs would look like a matrix. We need to identify which ones are more critical than others. And that matrix will help us, will guide us to identify the right CQAs for every for each phase of the programs at phase zero and at phase one phase two phase three and commercial the criticality of this quality attributes will increase but we define that much earlier you define early on we start with the presum uh, pr presumptive cqas until we get late phase cqas and commercial cqas this is all risk-based because you don't want to boil the ocean you don't want to make everything as the uh, critical value attribute. It has to be the right one. So that's why we need to have a risk-based approach here. So that is the basic introduction into from the process um, manufacturing process development, manufacturing process, how we define the CQAs from in a generic term. Then now how do we select the right methodology? How do we assess the right technology to actually define the right CQAs and assess the right CQAs. So here, I divide them into three sections. So we have got, whenever we are talking about analytical strategy, you are talking about three buckets. Bucket number one, with the most important bu bucket, is the release assays, the, to release drug substance, drug product. The bucket number two is extended characterization, which is very important, maybe lower in a hierarchy, but just as important. And the third bucket is in-process testing. They are all critical for an amicable drug product development. So having the right te technique at each of these stages for each of these buckets will facilitate early submission, will facilitate meaningful interaction with the agencies. So when I'm doing in-process testing, I have to be thinking, what do I like to see during release? Not only in, in, in terms of uh, critical quality attributes, but also in terms of technology. Are the technologies I'm using now for the in-process uh, testing. Are they going to be used for release or not? Are they going to be used for characterization or not? Ideally, in a small biotech uh, 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 organization environment, I want to be able to use as much as I can from my in-process characterization to release. They should be interchangeable. So for the in-process, it's important to have that to ensure I'm actually developing and manufacturing my drug substance effectively my drug product effectively and correctly. The extended characterization technologies are very important to ensure if I change anything, I have good understanding of my molecule, therefore I'll be able to, to check if I change a raw material, I will be able to identify that raw material has changed by doing my extended characterization. If I change vendors, I have to have a, an amicable uh, extended characterization techniques to tell me, I, going from vendor A to vendor B, manufacturer A to manufacturer B, therefore that comparability of drug substance and drug product is there, therefore we, I have to have that in place, so I'm not surprised. So I will give you a couple of examples on this one. And the release panel, 
Normally, the release testing panel is not everything in the CQA panel. It is a selected few from the CQA panel that we render to make them release uh, assays. And that is done by vetting, by also risk assessment. Some of the CQAs will remain as an in-process assays because of the risk level. The risk may not be high, so we render them as an in-process assays. Some of the critical elements of the CQAs, they, they go all the way to a release panel, a subset of them. So these are platform release panels. So it is, it is highly strategic, highly strategic to go with platform technology. Why is it important to go with platform technology? Number one, you save time instead of developing new techniques, you are using tested and tried technology. Number two, the agencies are exposed to this technology, therefore the, the likelihood of, of, the, of the company not getting questions and uh, information requests much lower when we use tried and tested methods, platform techniques. And number three, the budget. You save a lot on your budget to make sure that it works for you, for the company. So these are the basic parameters and has the basic attributes. For example, the, for content, when it comes to gene therapy, the vector titer is very important. The infectious genome titer is very important. The activities are very important. Some of this, you cannot platform. Like when you, for potency, you have to have uh, product specific potency. As it's something, there is no platform for that. For when it comes to the content, there is sort of a semi-platform technology. For example, DDPCR has been used successfully for many products, therefore it is transferable. It does require some development opti uh, and optimization, but it can be adopted and applied uh, freely. I would avoid new technologies when it comes to release panel as much as possible. I would, be, I would rather be boring when it comes to release than to be adventurous. That's very important. Sometimes some s small companies, they may want to get a, a risk with introducing new technology. It is okay, but we need to do it in a risk assessed fashion. Identity is an important uh, element, uh, attributes that we have to measure, and the purity and impurities. So all these technologies, there are established uh, basic techniques, but we also have to develop them. So we need, have, we need to have a strategy on how to select platform or non-platform. And of course, the last part, the safety assays are pretty much, most of them are compendial. We just have to use the compendial method unless our process does not fit these compendial uh, techniques. And this is basically trying to see from a vetting perspective, when we have te techniques, is important to assess, are these technologies transferable? Are they complex? We need to assess their complexity. If we don't have time to deal with many complex assays, we may be able to deal with one or two complex assays. The process is complex as it is. The number of techniques that are used for gene therapy, testing and release are double of protein biologics, triple small molecules. Therefore, we need to reduce our panel to the few meaningful assets and we need to make sure that we know what is uh, amenable to transfer, what are not. Why is that important? We don't want to spend too much time to transfer a complex method to a lab in a remote CMO because that may take a year and that may delay our programs unnecessarily. So we should be, we have to be cognizant what to transfer, what not to transfer. So this kind of assessment is important and it's also strategic. So this is part of the uh, uh, selection strategic method selection process. So we, the preferred is platform and the uh, Compendial is definitely as applicable. We use all the compendial available. If platform method does not exist, if we have to optimize, then we have to find a platform method and make it fit for purpose. We optimize it and develop it to make it fit for purpose. Once we do that, we assess it is transferability because most of the time a small biotech will not be able to release in a GMP setting. May not have the GMP environment to release a drug product or a drug substance, therefore we have to transfer it to a CMO. So we have to be cognizant about the, the applicability of this method to transfer the, uh, um, is, it, is it transferable? Is it trainable with junior analysis in a QC setting? So that's important criteria when we develop a method. And of course, what's important, so life cycle management. We have to be able to, to manage the method 
in a, uh, the life cycle has to be manageable. We don't want to get in trouble once we have five years of this method, then we cannot get the reagent. The instrument is the supported. So we have to make sure everything we do is meaningful for a long-term life cycle management of the program. So these are the criteria, as we said, we define the CQAs, then we define the criteria for the method that we are going to use to determine the CQA. So we determine the method, the uh, analytical criteria, analytical attributes to fit the CQAs of, uh, of interest. Once we identify them, we make this method, we screen them, we screen the methods. A screening a method is not necessarily in the lab. It's not a wet lab screening. It could be uh, data mining, it could be literature review, it could be assessment of what has been approved by the agency. That's what I mean by screening. But if we have the capacity and the budget, sometimes we may have to do uh, wet laboratory screening. Then, of course, we, we rank and score the technology per the need of the assessment. So this is what I just mentioned, uh, the criteria. We have the quality attributes, the, we, de we determine the uh, analytical tools, the, the right attributes in the analytical tools, then we assess them and we try to define what we need, what we need and w which method is more applicable for this specific scenario. Then once we choose the method, we may have to further develop it or we may be able to validate it directly. For a compendial method, we just have to do qualification. For a platform method, we may have to qualify for the early phase, for phase one and phase two, but then we have to validate for phase three based on the programs. So just to give a, a couple of examples in a, in a form of case study, the most important, I mean, some of the most critical, most important CQAs, critical quality attributes are potency, identity, and infectivity. So if I'm going to choose which technology is best for this, uh, for the three CQAs, as a small company, I may want to be able to, I may want to bundle the testing. I may, I may want to use a multi-attribute technology. By that, by doing that, I save money. I also save time. But the risk is that if that method does not work for one attribute, it might not work for others, so there's a high risk. So I need to assess what's out there. And for potency, it's very important. That's what I'm going to deliver. And for the identity, I have to make sure I'm making the right uh, sequence, the right DNA sequence uh, to, to serve the, the payload, the patient. And infectivity that the, the virus will be able to deliver this payload into the right uh, DNA machinery of the patient. This is one of the uh, three of the most critical, uh, critical quality attributes for gene therapy. So now when I, when I select for that, I say, what do I have available? I have chromatography technologies, electrophoretic, mass, spectros mass spectroscopy, immunological assays, as well as cell-based assays. I have to see if I want to do, if I want to bundle them. So I need to assess each one of these. Uh, how applicable are they for each of these three attributes? It will be different for each molecule, but that assessment, that uh, mental workout will help me navigate what is best for my molecule. So in this specific case, uh, the chromatographic technique is good for identity, maybe activity to a certain extent, but not uh, infectivity. Uh, the same with ele electrophoretic platform, the same for with ma mass spec. But when it comes to immunological assays, I may be able to do three of them with, with, uh, with one technology. Cell-based technology may also enable me to do three of them in one. So it is a risk-based assessment and based on the assessment, I choose which method I want to use. In this specific case, without naming the product, the cell-based assay was chosen with high complexity. In my mind, the immunological might have been better. But the point is that this kind of exercise is critical for a strategic analytical assessment to ensure we have the right techniques that will travel with the molecule from early to late phase. So we create a method selection metrics based on what we said for, for potency, we need to have a criteria, accuracy, linearity, precision, LOQ. For infectivity, we need to look at the titer, again, accuracy, linearity, and precision. For identity, I need to make sure I have specific, the method has to be specific. And then, how practical is this technology? If I do it in my lab, will the CMO be able to do it? That's also a very important consideration. 
So based on that, I create a risk, uh, a risk matrix and also a score the risk based on the, on the risk. I choose the technology. So this is a top level approach. People don't spend this, early, they don't spend this much effort from an early programs. The idea is the earlier we do this, the more effective we are, the more success we have with the agencies down the line. This sheer exercise does help progress the programs faster. So select the analytical tool. So I'll give one example of analytical tool. So another critical, critical, uh, critical quality attribute, very important quality attribute is uh, the full capsid and empty capsid. So when I have this viral capsid, it contains my DNA. My DNA is my payload. So the full capsid is what I'm looking for. Full capsid is what I'm looking for. I don't want empty capsid. And I do not want partially filled capsids. So this is a very important CQA. And the technology to manage that, to test for this, is also, uh, we have options. But we have to be able to choose the right technology for the right setting. Because if I am not able to determine empty capsid from full capsid, if I'm not able to determine the full caps from uh, a partial field capsid, I have a risk. I can compromise my, my, my molecule, my drug substance or drug product. The empty capsids can actually increase the risk of imm uh, immune reaction, immunogenicity. The partial field capsid can also, if they don't have the right partial DNA in there, they could also induce immune reaction if they have fragments, if they have impure DNA in them. So having the right technique to measure the full capsid is critical. So to go through the motion, so what techniques do I have available? There are multiple techniques, selected a few of them, DDPCR, digital drop, uh, droplet PCR, and UVVs, uh, SecMOLs, uh, IX, and uh, CDMS, CIF, AUC. These are optional technologies. All of these technologies are options that we can use for uh, full capsid or empty capsid determination. But they have benefits and disadvantages. Advantage and disadvantages. So based on this advantage and disadvantage, I will be able to select the right technique. If I'm interested only in the release panel, I may want to go with the more reliable technology like AUC. Analytical ultracentrifugation is the most uh, widely used technique to measure full capsid, empty capsid ratio. The, the, the CDM is the charge distribution, the charge detection. Mass spec is also coming upcoming technique, but it is not widely available for, uh, QC, for QC release use. Uh, AX is also useful, but you have to be able to develop it further. AUC does not require a lot of development. It does require tweaking and optimizing. Then you have got DDPCR and ELISA. DDPCR will measure the DNA content, and the ELISA will measure the protein content. And you have a ratio of these two, because basically the more DNA you have to protein ratio, you are on the right track. But when you use two techniques to measure, to get one data, the risk of variability is high. So ideally, you want to use one technique to be able to measure this important parameter. So based on what is needed, you ca we can determine which technique is more useful. If I'm only interested for a rapid data on demand to progress the process development activity, UVVs or dynamic light scattering may be useful. But if I'm interested to characterize, I went from a manufacturer A to manufacturer B, that I may want to do multiple orthogonal techniques. I may want to do CDMS, I want to do AUC, and maybe DLS to make sure that I have the right full to empty ratio. So this is an example on how we can select the right technology to measure a full to empty capsid ratio. This is just basically what I said. Based on the need, we could determine what kind of uh, uh, instrument is applicable, relevant, for our needs, uh, for our uh, application. Okay, so in conclusion, so when we develop uh, AAV, having the right CQA determined early on is critical. We could call it presumptive CQAs, but having that is critical because that will help us determine what kind of analytical technology are needed. For the gene therapy, you are talking about 15 to 20 assay uh, types. It's a lot of assays to manage. 
to the earlier, the better. And part of, important, uh, part of the critical strategy is that we need to have the CKA as a testing paradigm established early on, meaning that I will need this as a release. I will keep this as a characteristic. As a, when we determine that early on, it will help us minimize the burden on the QC testing down the line. So we don't have to have so many assays that go all the way to manufacturing or to operation. Uh, adopting platform technology, as I said, is important and useful. It should be determined early on. We should avoid having specific, specified methods, uh, difficult, complex methods, difficult to transfer methods. We should avoid them unless it is really critical. Um, again, we should think about continuous improvement and we should think about developing the platform methods to make them mo far more refined for the intended uh, use of the technology. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I have a couple of uh, minutes for questions. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Ness, uh, you know, what about the stability? You know, you have uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, gene therapy product or cell therapy product, how do you assess the stability of this product long term? Yeah. Very good question, uh, Ron. So the, w early on, we need to make sure that by doing force deck and accelerated stability studies during early development, we established the shelf life propensity of the molecule and also determine which are the stability indicating methodologies. And that we do it the earlier we do it, the better, because then it will help us gain credibility on our shelf life. When you're talking about, uh, you know, changing some of these parameters and or changing suppliers, uh, you know, qualifying manufacturers, do you always, when you do that, go to potency assay to make sure the potency assay is working? Of course, you have all the different uh, CQAs. Uh, but, uh, you know, you might be scanning, you know, size exclusion chromatography might be different things, but uh, I think the potency assay would be critical, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right around. The most important uh, parameter, quality attribute is the potency. And of course, in addition to that, by the, in the risk-based assessment, the uh, full to empty capsule will also be very important. We try to do, when we go from manufacturer A to B, we do a tiered approach. First, we have to make sure that the release panel are intact. We also determine a new acceptance criteria, extended characterization methods, but the potency, the, uh, the potency, the tighter, as well as the full to empty uh, ratio would be some of the critical elements. Last question, Ness. Uh, uh, in the stability studies that you conduct, do you con are you concerned about uh, genetic modification uh, where the gene might change over time or mutate or change? And how do you keep track of that? Is there an assay that you can check yeah. to make sure that? You have stability there. Very good question, Ron. Yeah, the, the genetic uh, titer. So we have the right primers. When you measure for the titer, for the content, you have to amplify the right sequence of the DNA. It's a part of the stability. You measure for that, for stability. Because over the years, it shouldn't change, but you, you have to amplify. If you don't amplify it, it will show immediately. The content will go down. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you.